course, one Martin Luther King Jr., who, of course, who was involved in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. So I want to welcome you back, of course, to History 2023. Uh, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there uh, overall. Uh, of course, this week, uh, of course, I'll be, you know, talking a lot about the 1960s, which was really a turbulent period in American history. So we'll talk about the civil rights movement. Uh, you got the Vietnam conflict kind of going on, all those different protests, of course, against different things. So anyway, uh, looks like now we've got two students uh, watching right now. Of course, we've got uh, looks Ross again. Of course, hey, good afternoon. Hope you're doing great out there. Uh, overall, uh, of course, Jennifer Cornitas. Yeah, happy Tuesday. Oh, I guess getting close to the end, I know, uh, this semester. Yeah, we only got a few days left, of course, of classes this week. So hopefully you're wrapping up stuff in different classes, of course, uh, right now. Um, yeah, semester is almost over. Yay, you know, getting close to it, of course. Uh, so, yeah, finals, of course, final exams, of course, will start next week uh, at Baton Rouge Community College. I pretty much finished the final exam. I think most of it's going to be it's looking like World War II and pretty much the Cold War era. Most most of the main stuff we'll cover, of course, uh, we're covering this week and last week. So uh, anyway, kind of talk about uh, – I don't think we have too many reminders right now. I think uh, the second exam had just wrapped up, uh, so I hope you <laughs> got to take that. Uh, if you miss, miss an assignment, let me know. Of course, we might be able to – do a makeup or something like that. But um, I think you need to right now concentrate, you know, on trying to get that final exam done next. That's going to be the main thing, of course, they'll have to do. Uh, and then, of course, um, other thing, uh, other thing, of course, uh, I don't know if everybody's hopefully turned in their research papers. Uh, if you haven't done that, you know, you can email those to me. I uh, should be able to get that in too. If you need to grade on that. Uh, and then um, the Veterans Project, anybody doing the oral oral project for veterans. Uh, that's going to be due Saturday, May 1st. I think it's going to be probably the deadline on that. So if anybody else is kind of wrapping up that, you need to, of course, get that to me. Uh, you can either email it or you can maybe post it in the speed grader uh, on the actual assignment. So uh, anyway, like I said, uh, today I'm going to, of course, be uh, moving on to talk about like I said, mostly the 1960s. I'll probably kind of start touching a little bit on the 70s, maybe early 70s. So I'm going to kind of talk about the Lyndon B. Johnson administration a lot. Uh, then you have Richard Nixon that comes in right afterwards, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. So a lot of my main emphasis, of course, will be, like I said, probably the two biggest things we'll talk about the most will be the civil rights movement, of course, and then the Vietnam War, which we kind of end up losing, of course, in the end. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions, of course, about this lecture uh, during the live stream, or, of course, you got a question, of course, later, uh, you can later, you know, put it on my channel uh, or previous, any kind of previous lecture, you can, of course, uh, send me any kind of comments, questions, which you do get bonus points for. So um, anyway, uh, I think previously we had talked about the fact that John F. Kennedy uh, had been uh, assassinated. I think that was one of the last things that we had talked about uh, where Kennedy, the Kennedy got shot, uh, as you know. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that happened, of course, uh, as you know, is that we got a new president uh, that comes in at uh, that point, which is uh, Lennon B. Johnson. Uh, he right here. Johnson, of course, was president from 1963 uh, to 1969. Of course, he ended up finishing uh, you know, John F. Kennedy's term uh, from November 63 uh, to early January 1969. Well, uh, he did not have a vice president, by the way, which is kind of weird about Johnson when he came in. Uh, his vice president under his next term, like from 65 to 69, uh, was Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was from Minnesota. Uh, so, so 36th president of the United States, uh, as you can see. Uh, and um, one thing that Johnson was very famous for, he was famous for this thing you may have heard of called the Great Society. You've probably heard of that, uh, which was a series of like legislation passed through Congress uh, that created all kinds of new programs, uh, not just civil rights stuff, uh, but also you heard of Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. Uh, you may have heard of 
all those kind of things were something that LBJ uh, helped to develop. Uh, and um, it was kind of a, he called it the war on poverty. It was kind of a way to improve, you know, the United States, uh, get people out of poverty, uh, also get rid of racial uh, injustice uh, as well. Uh, some of these programs were popular, by the way, and still are today, uh, like, like, you know, welfare and things like that that are around uh, were all, of course, created by it. Uh, if you heard Head Start, he created Head Start. Uh, I don't think he did, did as well. Uh, later, it was criticized. Uh, of course, they, they cut taxes, but they ended up spending a lot of money on entitlements. Uh, they spent a lot of money on the Vietnam War. Uh, and so it was kind of controversial. Uh, and they think a lot of that led later to, of course, stagflation, if you know, which happened in the 1970s, where the economy of America was not that great, uh, more or less. But civil rights, you know, civil rights movement, you know, that's the thing, uh, of course, that LBJ is kind of associated with because of all the different civil rights acts he passed, uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, as well that was passed. So all these things, of course, helped to, you know, uh, make LBJ very popular uh, as a president. It's also part of why a lot of African-Americans started switching from the Republican Party uh, to the Democratic Party uh, because of the fact that the Democrats helped to get all this legislation passed. Uh, and if I think without LBJ, you know, and maybe Kennedy getting assassinated, it might not have happened until later, uh, quite possibly. Uh, let's kind of talk about the civil rights. Like, why did the civil rights movement start? Well, obviously, it went back to, you know, going back to Reconstruction, where uh, Reconstruction obviously did not, you know, create enough, you know, rights for African Americans, which was taken away, uh, especially in the South. Uh, and um, they believed that the World War II was a major issue of why um, the civil rights movement started. Uh, a lot of African Americans uh, came back from the war. Uh, they had fought in the war, and you know they were in Europe. And in Europe, you know they had all these rights they had. And there was no segregation in Europe, like in different countries, you know, Britain, Italy, or whatever they were at uh, at one point. Uh, and so that was part of it right there. So you had that that first thing happening uh, as well. Uh, also, I think I mentioned this before about the fact that um, under President Truman, there was a case where they began to segregate, desegregate um, the armed forces, uh, which happened in 1948. So that was another issue uh, that they think kind of, you know, got the ball rolling uh, that led to desegregation. So, yeah, they're desegregating the military. Why can't they desegregate everything else publicly? You know, like say businesses, restaurants, schools, whatever. Uh, so people start to think those those kind of ideas uh, also as well. So that's definitely something that was a major issue, of course, that was influential. Uh, also, they had this other case I think I mentioned before, which was really important. They think that helped to kind of start the civil rights movement in, in, in basically uh, the 1950s, and that was the so-called court case I mentioned before, Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, 1954, uh, you can see. And uh, Linda Brown uh, was a woman that um, I think she, I think they sued. That was they had sued um, the local schools, Topeka, Kansas, uh, because they had to basically, I think they had to go to school. Uh, like it was eight miles to go to school. And they had a white school nearby that they only had to walk half a mile or something like that. And so they basically sued basically for her to go to school. That's what it was. And uh, eventually they overturned the case. If you know about this, uh, in uh, 1954, uh, the court case, uh, which was, I told you, Brown versus Board of Education, became a landmark case because uh, it overturned Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, which went back to 1896, which had you know made separate but equal facilities and all that legal uh, in the United States. And so that, that was one of the big things that really started the civil rights movement, uh, more or less, uh, in the United States. So it's a very, very important issue uh, that basically occurs. And so it happens over time, just segregation, like schools and so on, starts to disappear. Like in the north, uh, out in the west, uh, schools start desegregating. But the only thing that had not desegregated, if you know about this, was by the 1960s, 
schools in the South, like Southern, Southern, Southern states, uh, refused to desegregate. It was kind of an issue, along with other things, you know, buses, restaurants, stores, and so on. Uh, so um, that's something that'll take a while to basically occur. Uh, so that's that's something that basically uh, there's other issues that were kind of famous. Uh, also, I can mention about that were famous during the civil rights movement. They always talk about the story about um, you probably heard of Rosa Parks, uh, which famously happened uh, in 1955 uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and um, they usually call it the Rosa Parks incident. I think is what they dub it. And this was a case where um, basically um, she was kind of staged. They do admit about the thing, but she basically got on this bus. Uh, and normally African-Americans would have to sit in the back and then the whites would sit in the front. Well, she basically went and sat in the front seat. Uh, there were only two people on the bus, by the way. This That guy there Whitman, was with him, behind him, and eventually got arrested for it. Uh, and uh, anyway, it eventually uh, caused a um, basically a strike when African-Americans like, refused to basically a boycott, refused to basically ride the buses uh, in Montgomery. The so-called Montgomery bus boycott followed, which lasted about a year. Uh, and what happened was eventually the um, uh, what happened was the Supreme Court stepped in. And in 1956, they declared that segregated buses was illegal. Uh, and so uh, they ended up winning. Uh, and so they think that was another case, I guess, uh, that would basically propel, help propel, you know, the whole civil rights movement. Uh, I don't know if you know about, about Baton Rouge. Uh, they had something similar to it that was called the, I'll put it on the screen, but it was called the they call it the Baton Rouge bus boycott that was in 1953 where uh, Reverend T.J. Jemison, who was a local reverend, Baton Rouge, he actually started a bus boycott because you know, it was an issue with the, kind of the same thing. Uh, and so they think the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 was kind of a copy of that one. Uh, so it's kind of similar to it. Uh, one thing that's very famous about the Montgomery bus boycott was Martin Luther King kind of emerged uh, as a major figure. He kind of started, that was his first thing he really started with, uh, basically with the civil rights movement. And uh, King was a local Christian minister. He was from Atlanta, Georgia. He went to Morehouse College, as they talked about. He's also educated other schools. So he went to Boston University uh, later as well. Uh, and King was, was, uh, he basically believed that the best way that that, that African Americans could get their civil rights equality, uh, in general, was through nonviolent protests. They they didn't think violence was a way to do it. You know, mass riots and things like that. You kind of see now. He, he didn't think that was the right way to do things, uh, more or less. And so he advanced the movement through like use of like nonviolent protests, civil disobedience, sit-ins. You know what a sit-in is? Well, where they sit in a restaurant and try to get served until the, you know, they get arrested or they, or they, they do get served. Uh, various marches, peaceful marches, of course, uh, like the Selma to Montgomery March as an example in 1965. Uh, he was heavily influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. I don't know if you know that or not. Gandhi, uh, who was in India, who helped get um, independence for India that, that broke away from the British Empire. So he, he read a lot of his books and stuff like that. Uh, and was heavily influenced by him uh, for his movement. Uh, there were other people, by the way, that were in the civil rights movement I did want to mention about uh, that are also famous. Uh, Med Medgar Evers, you may have heard of him, uh, who uh, was a part of, um, he was like part of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Uh, I, I don't have the name there, Stokely Carmichael. Uh, he was involved with the Black Panthers, who were kind of more radical. Uh, of course, Malcolm X, uh, from the Nation of Islam uh, as well. He was somewhat radical too, a little bit as well, uh, compared to, say, King, who was more nonviolent. Uh, so, so yeah, those are people, you know, that were kind of famous. The top three here, by the way, are all assassinated at one point. I don't know if you know that or not. Medgar Evers was killed by the KKK. Uh, Martin Luther King was killed by, they think, James Earl Ray, but they're not sure if that's really true or not. 
Uh, X was, I think, killed by someone who was in the Nation of Islam that I think disagreed with his views or whatever. Uh, but he was basically, they're all killed at one point uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. And that's Rosa Parks, of course, again, on the bottom right. Uh, Martin Luther King, of course, uh, was very famous. He was, like you said, he was a spokesman for the whole civil rights movement. And uh, King King uh, was involved uh, in this um, civil rights organization that you did you do kind of probably need to know a little bit about, which is called the SCLC, uh, which is called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was like the base of the whole civil rights movement. There were there are other groups you may have heard of called CORE. SNCC, you know, SNCC, and all those other groups that were there, students involved, I think, with that one. Uh, and um, so he had all different civil rights groups that were there. And um, they think that King, uh, along with, they think, LBJ, and I guess what happened with the Kennedy assassination, all kind of helped to basically eventually get civil rights legislation passed uh, at the time. Uh, so uh, some of the big things that, of course, came later uh, because of the Civil Rights Movement, you had, of course, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act of, of 1964. That was one of the first things that really uh, came out uh, right after the Kennedy assassination. Uh, that was all done. Uh, you know, it was heavily influenced by this famous event uh, that happened that you may have heard about uh, is the famous um March on Washington, which happened on August 28th, uh, 1963. Uh, and that's where King, you know, if you know about it, uh, gave his famous speech. He was like one of the last speakers uh, that was involved uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and uh, he, he actually was the one that organized it. He was trying to organize a march on Washington, not just to get equal rights, but rights for like economic reasons as well. Uh, and so it led to the so-called I Have a Dream speech, which basically called for the end of racism. Uh, he talks about this idea that, you know, blacks and whites could sit down at the same table with all that uh, together. Uh, and so that, that was something that they definitely think was a heavy influence on why the uh, civil rights legislation passed and all that. Uh, and uh, what did the Civil Rights Act of 1964 actually do, uh, more or less? Well, I'll put it on the screen for you here, but it basically, uh, you could not segregate like businesses. You could not segregate transportation, like buses and trains and things like that, uh, that had been, of course, before. Uh, banned employment discriminations. So they couldn't, you couldn't like discriminate somebody based on their race, uh, their sex, religion, things like that, et cetera. Like, of course, they do today. So those are things that were, of course, passed initially. Uh, LBJ also helped to get passed uh, also the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That was a landmark, of course, act that was passed uh, through Congress. Of course, you could not discriminate people based on race with voting. Uh, so no matter what, somebody goes to register to vote, you know, you can't have poll taxes, you know, literacy tests uh, to prevent people from voting and things like that. Uh, also, they had the Civil Rights Act. It's a little later, 1968, uh, which pre prohibited discrimination in housing, uh, like renting or buying or whatever. Uh, so you couldn't discriminate people based on race, sex, religion, national origin, et cetera, and all those different things, of course, uh, today. So all that was, of course, stuff that really, of course, occurred uh, in the 1960s, which King helped to basically, of course, do. Uh, King was involved in some other things that I did want to mention about uh, that were uh, also famous as well. They also had this thing, uh, which was the Selma to Montgomery marches uh, that took place as well uh, in 1965, like in the spring it was. And um, many of these protests, by the way, were on national TV. There were cases where uh, they were using like tear gas, dogs, beating people up. Uh, and things like that uh, violently. Uh, I think it was Bull Connor, I think he was, I want to say, was the head of the police, I think, and I think it was a state police, I know, beating up a lot of people. Uh, and uh, the worst day was a day called Bloody Sunday, which happened on March 7th, where a bunch of protesters were actually beat up on U.S. Highway 80 as they tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge 
uh, into Selma, Alabama. Uh, and uh, they were protesting all the injustices in Alabama. Uh, they were kind of going on uh, at the time. Uh, and um, I think here's a picture of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, which is right here. Uh, and so a lot of people participated in that. It wasn't just um, African-Americans. They had a lot of whites that participated also in a lot of these protests uh, across America uh, as well. Uh, by the way, Martin Luther King did, by the way, uh, he did get, of course, um, a Nobel Prize, which is true about that. In 1964, uh, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize for a lot of his civil rights activism uh, in the United States. Uh, but sadly, as you know, uh, he was assassinated about four years later, of course, in 1968 uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he is famous for one of his last speeches he gave, uh, which is called, I Have Been to the Mountaintop. Of course, most people did not know he would be assassinated, uh, which would be the next day. Uh, and uh, I think he does talk about the fact that he might get shot by some crazy white guy. <laughs> by the way, he mentions that in the speech, I think. Uh, it's kind of ironic. Uh, and so the next day at what is the Lorraine Motel, uh, which is in Memphis, he had stepped outside and somebody with a high-powered rifle shot him. I think at 30 out six, they believe, uh, is what it was. Uh, he pretty much died right afterwards. And uh, they believe the man that may have shot him was a man named James Earl Ray, uh, who I think was an ex-con, uh, although it's been debated about whether he was really the lone gunman uh, or actually maybe it could have been somebody else uh, that may have shot uh, Dr. King. Uh, I think even like one, some of the King family thinks that he didn't do it. Uh, James Earl Ray was just the guy they arrested, uh, and it was another guy that shot him. So it's been, been kind of kind of a controversy about who who actually shot uh, Martin Luther King still today. So that's kind of talking about you know some of these uh, policies that happened. And by the way, the King King assassination that was a bad thing. It, it caused like mass riots in something like a hundred cities or more. Kind of like stuff going on now, all these different riots that are kind of going on. Uh, it, it was really bad. They had a lot of different riots, of course, uh, in the 1960s that were really, really bad. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on uh, and, of course, talk also about Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, Johnson would, by the way, run for re-election uh, in 1964. Uh, of course, if you know much about it, Johnson ran against this guy named Barry Goldwater, uh, who was from uh, Arizona, uh, and um, you kind of want to thank you right here, but uh, of course Humphrey Hup Hubert Humphrey was his vice president that he would nom he would you know they nominate eventually uh, the Democrats. Then uh, Goldwater Goldwater was Republican, and Goldwater, by the way, uh, if you study about American politics, he was one of the first Republicans uh, that pushed the idea of conservatism. Uh, you see, you know, you got, you know, him and Nixon and Reagan that come later uh, that are more conservative type politicians. And so you start seeing Republicans starting to, to, to push more over to being more conservative, from, you know, because previously the Democrats uh, had been more conservative. The Republicans had been more liberal. And they start switching uh, the two parties, which they do like around the 1960s. Uh, but um, if you know about uh, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, he painted Goldwater as this right wing type candidate who had connections with the KKK, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then uh, if you know about what happened too uh, in the uh, 1964 election, uh, LBJ uh, used some campaign ads to make, um, you know, Goldwater look like this crazy guy. Uh, and there's a one that one that's very famous. I usually show. It's only about a minute long, uh, but it's one called the Daisy ad uh, that was made, uh, where it shows this girl picking flowers, like a, like like the petals of a flower, and a nuclear bomb, of course, goes off in the background. Uh, and so uh, the Democrats tried to paint Goldwater as this crazy guy that if he got elected, he would use nuclear weapons against the Soviets. Here's a little short video about it. Four, five, seven, 
Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. That was, of course, one of the, one of the first major uh, TV ads ever made uh, during a presidential election, of course. Obviously, it made a difference, uh, of course, because, you know, uh, Johnson ended up, of course, winning a landslide. And, of course, people used to call, by the way, Lyndon Johnson. They called him um, uh, Landslide Lyndon, if you know about this. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he beat him pretty good. Goldwater was defeated pretty bad uh, in the election, even like in the popular vote. You know, you can see Johnson had 486 electoral votes with 43 million actual uh, popular vote. Goldwater only got 52 electoral votes uh, with 27 million. But you do notice one thing that's interesting about this election, of course, with that map. You start to see uh, that the Republicans start to win some southern states. So obviously the so-called solid south is starting to fade. That's something you do notice even as far back as, of course, 1964. So so anyway, uh, the video, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it helped him win, though, uh, things like that, of course, uh, as well. So. So anyway, that's how Johnson, of course, stayed in power, of course. Of course, some people would regret that later because of what would happen, uh, you know, uh, with v Vietnam. But uh, when Johnson was running running for president in 1964, he ran on that Great Society program. He kind of talked about it in a speech, uh, I think in Michigan, 1964. And so that became the na name of all of his programs that he would, of course, have later, uh, which would help to alleviate, like I said, poverty, civil rights. Uh, also help out the elderly, uh, like they extended basically more Social Security and other benefits, uh, of course, throughout the United States uh, as well. Hey, what's going on? Hey, hey, what's up, Kay? Hope you're doing great uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, yeah, class is almost over. I know you're right about that. It's getting close. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Johnson is known for a lot of programs you may have heard of. You ever heard of Medicaid, of course, which is more like, you know, stuff for obviously impoverished. If you can't get, you know, medical care, like medical insurance, uh, that's for the poor. Medicare for the elderly. Uh, I think I mentioned about that. Uh, talked about Head Start, uh, which was this preschool program uh, that started throughout the United States, which is still around. So all those are still around today. Medicaid, Medicare, Head Start. Uh, back when dad worked for Head Start for years, uh, like in East Baton Rouge Parish, he was like kind of associated with it for a long time, for about 10 years. Uh, and uh, these are other programs you may have heard of. Job Corps, you may have heard of that. Uh, Upward Bound, which is now called TRIO or TRIO Bound, you may have heard of that. Food Stamp Act of 1964, Social Security Act of 1965, Welfare, you have Welfare Today and all that. That's basically other programs that were part of the Great Society uh, as examples up there. Now, I already talked about the civil rights stuff, right? 1964-68, Voting Rights Act. Uh, so LBJ did a lot of good things. Uh, a lot of people think he was a great president. Uh, but what happened later, if you know about it, was they had the Vietnam War, which kind of brought his whole administration down. So that was the only bad thing about with that. Uh, it did cause poverty rates to drop among African Americans. That's something that is true about a lot of these programs. Uh, if you look at these statistics here, uh, 1960, it dropped basically poverty from 55% to 27% within eight years. So it did actually do something to decrease the poverty rate. Today, it's about 18.8% among African Americans. That's what it is today, which is obviously a lot higher compared to, say, probably white Americans or whatever, uh, but that's a lot different between, that's like 
like a third, it's like two thirds less, I guess, if you look at the numbers, 55 versus 18.8. That's a big difference. Uh, some people criticize it, though. That's what, something I will mention about. Some people did not like his war on poverty uh, because what happened was it got people to be too dependent on the government. Uh, so people, you know, start getting welfare and other things uh, and they can't get out of poverty. That was the only problem. It creates a cycle of poverty, uh, which has kind of been criticized and all that. But it was intended to basically help get people out of poverty, but not stay in it. That's something you have to understand about food stamps, you know, uh, welfare and all these other things. They're just supposed to be temporary until you get back on your feet uh, or whatever. That's something they didn't have, you know, going back to the Great Depression and all that. There was nothing really to help people uh, out now. Uh, now, of course, the big thing I'm going to talk about today, which, like I said, consumed, you know, LBJ's administration, you know, uh, was the Vietnam War, uh, which really lasts about, for us, about 10 years uh, that we fought uh, in this war. Uh, and uh, it's basically why his administration was considered a failure. Uh, in the, and even though he did all these civil rights things and other things he did, uh, to help out American society, uh, in the end, it was a very unpopular conflict. Uh, Fifty-eight some thousand Americans died uh, in the Vietnam War. Uh, it's one of our bloodiest conflicts since really World War II. Also sparked a lot of mass protests, uh, especially among young people, like students in college, because uh, a lot of them were forced to be drafted, uh, if you know about that in the war, because uh, previous wars, you know, I think most Americans that had fought were mostly middle class that didn't have good jobs and things like that. And so they started drafting people uh, during the Vietnam War because they were trying to make it more equal among the lower classes versus the upper classes, which a lot of people didn't like. I think of the upper middle classes and all that is why they protest part of it, because you know, they didn't want to go to fight. And um, let me talk about why it happened. Why did the Vietnam War occur? <laughs> it had nothing to do with us, believe it or not. Uh, it had to do uh, with the French. The French, uh, if you know about this, after World War II, uh, tried to take over Indochina, which they had before the, before the World War II, but the Japanese had been in there. And so they were trying to uh, uh, create an empire out of Indochina, I think mostly because of like rubber and other uh, natural resources that were, of course, in that area uh, in Indochina, where Vietnam is to now, now today. Uh, and so it sparked the first Indochina War, uh, which lasts from the 1940s up to about 1954. And uh, they ended up fighting this uh, group called the Viet Minh, uh, who were communists uh, that were part of a Vietnamese national independence movement, uh, where they wanted to create a Viet Vietnamese state, uh, which Ho Chi Minh had kind of wanted going back, I think, before World War II even broke out. And uh, Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh was this uh, Vietnamese communist that had gone to the Soviet Union, uh, and he had uh, been influenced by them. And Ho Chi Minh was later the president of what we call North Vietnam uh, for a bunch of years. Uh, I think up to I think the, close to the end of the war. And uh, so uh, what ended up happening was the French uh, ended up losing the conflict. I think by 1954, uh, you may have heard of the battle called Dien Bien Phu, uh, where the French were surrounded by Viet Minh forces in, I think, northern Vietnam. And so they were forced to withdraw uh, from Indochina. And so one of the things that happened after the Vietnam, that first Vietnam conflict ended, uh, they, they basically split Vietnam in half. I think I've got a sl slide here showing uh, North Vietnam. But North Vietnam, uh, it's hard to see it in that picture, but it's eventually divided uh, at a parallel, which is called the 17th parallel. Uh, they divide in two, uh, and there's two states. You've got what is basically North Vietnam, uh, which is a communist state uh, that was led by Ho Chi Minh. And then they have the uh, other state below, South Vietnam. Uh, which was, of course, led by this guy named No Dinh Diem, who was the president, I think, up to like 19, I want to say 63. And that state was more of a capitalist democratic state backed by the United States. So the area in that kind of dark yellow 
up there. Uh, that was where the Red River is, where, Han where Hanoi is the capital of. Hanoi was the capital, of course, of North Vietnam. And then you had South Vietnam, of course, uh, with Saigon uh, as the capital. Now it's Ho Chi Minh City. But you can see all the different battles at one point uh, that were fought, especially during the Tet Offensive, which will be, of course, later. So that was initially, you know, the Vietnam War. Uh, and um, what happened to get, uh, oh, and by the way, I kind of talk about this for later, but in the Vietnam conflict, the United States fought two different enemies. We fought the North Vietnamese regular forces, which were sometimes called the NVA. Uh, and then they also had this thing called the National Liberation Front, NLF, which people in Vietnam called Viet Cong, which meant Viet, Viet, Vietnamese communists. Uh, the VC or Victor Charlie, they sometimes called him. And um, they basically both fought against us. And uh, I'll get to it later, but the um, North Vietnamese used what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, to infiltrate the South uh, through what is Laos and Cambodia uh, to attack South Vietnam. And so that's what kind of helped to make the Vietnam War kind of a war which was fought all over South Vietnam. Uh, so there were actually no actual real front front lines because they could be they could attack anywhere because uh, of that now how did the united states get in the conflict well there was an incident that happened uh in 1964 uh, which i wanted to mention which was called the gulf of tonkin incident where apparently there was a uss destroyer called the maddox uh, that was fired upon or they think what was north vietnamese gunboats uh, which I think they fired machine guns at him. I don't know about torpedoes, maybe, uh, basically. Was that another one called the Turner Joy that may have also been shot at as well? Uh, and so the United States decided that uh, basically they needed to intervene. It happened about August 1964 when it occurred. And it led to the so-called Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was passed by Congress, which basically gave President Johnson uh, the right to intervene uh, in Vietnam. And so what they first did in 1964 was they started bombing North Vietnam initially. And then in 1965, uh, they brought in troops as well. Uh, so they started you know, escalating the war uh, with land forces uh, and all that. And uh, if you know about the Vietnam War conflict, uh, it became like a police action. We never really uh, declared war on North Vietnam. We didn't really do that. And um, eventually by 1968, uh, the uh, war would escalate uh, further, uh, especially when the Tet Offensive, of course, occurs. Uh, Vietnam was an interesting war. It was a very mobile war. Uh, of course, if you know about Vietnam, it's a lot of jungles and things like that. Uh, so it's hard to kind of get around. Uh, so if you know about it, they used a lot of helicopters uh, throughout Vietnam. And so oftentimes the Vietnam War was known as the helicopter war. Or some people call it the 10,000 day war because it lasted so many years uh, fighting. Uh, and um, the peak of Vietnam... Uh, was really uh, with the so-called Tet Offensive uh, that occurred in January, February of 1968. Uh, and uh, the Tet Offensive was where the um, North Vietnamese uh, and also the NLF, which is the, you know, the Viet Cong, basically uh, attacked simultaneously uh, across all of, of South Vietnam. It was the largest military campaign, really, of the whole Vietnam War. Uh, I think we have lost more Americans, I think, in that actual conflict uh, with that. Uh, and they believe that the uh, Vietnam conflict uh, with the Tet Offensive, uh, a lot of Americans started thinking that this war is never going to end. Uh, there's going to be no light uh, at the end of the tunnel uh, and all that. And so a lot of people in the public, if you know about that, turned against uh, the actual war, especially around 1968. 69, uh, people start protesting against the draft, like uh, burning their, their draft cards. Uh, women burn their bras, <laughs> you know, about that, uh, things like that. So it led to massive protests. There were like a lot of protests uh, across the United States 
Uh, and uh, like especially on college campuses, there was like a lot of like protests and strikes uh, that took place also in high schools uh, as well. And it, it was so bad that Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson, basically in 1968, is his approval rating plummeted uh, and he basically decided not to run for re-election, uh, which is true about that. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's like the Vietnam War spawned a lot of protests, uh, which is true about that. Um, think about images of some of the protests. Even the veterans uh, that fought in the war uh, began to protest uh, as well. So a lot of university-type protests uh, you can see uh, that were kind of going on uh, in the war. Uh, there are even like chants that they had uh, as well. Uh, that became famous. Uh, the, the big ones that were well known, the most famous one, of course, they had uh, was Hey, Hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I think that's one of the most famous uh, they had that's well known. Uh, also, they had uh, Hell No, We Won't Go, Make Love, Not War. I think that was one of the most famous ones they had. 18 today, dead tomorrow. <laughs> so all those famous little quotes. They had songs too, and anti-war protest songs, movies also, I guess, were kind of like that. So yeah, the hippies, hippies all kind of got into it uh, as well. So all that was stuff that happened uh, with the Vietnam War that really helped to, you know, cause LBJ's administration to kind of fall apart. Uh, and it leads to Richard Nixon eventually, of course, getting elected uh, in 1968 uh, as well. Now, one of the things that happened, of course, that's it's true about, you know, uh, the, like I said, the 1968 was a very turbulent uh, period. Like they had all kinds of riots breaking out. Uh, there was mass violence uh, everywhere. Like they had the 1968 uh, Democratic National Convention, which was very violent. They burned down part of like Chicago, uh, you had the MLK assassination. Uh, they had that touched off a bunch of riots. So all these kind of unrest uh, within society that we had, of course, in 1968. Well, uh, if you know what happened, they had different men uh, that were running uh, in the 1968 uh, presidential election uh, that I wanted to mention about uh, that were there. Uh, of course, here's a map showing you the 1968 election uh, there are like three or four different men uh, that ran uh, for election in 1968. Uh, you had Richard Nixon, uh, you had Hubert Humphrey, uh, you had George Wallace. Uh, there was also Robert F. Kennedy, which I'll kind of mention a little bit. He also ran uh, in 1968 uh, that you had. Of course, Nixon would end up winning this election uh, pretty easily. Uh, and um, let me kind of go through uh, and talk about some of the different, of course, ones that were out there that ran. You first had Richard Nixon, uh, who later became the 37th president of the United States. Uh, he, of course, he had been previously vice president under Dwight Eisenhower, a uh, senator as well before that from California. Uh, and so he, he basically was the one that the Republicans nominated uh, in 1968. Uh, and Nixon, by the way, was the most successful of the candidates uh, in 1968, his campaign was centered on two things uh, that were pretty important that he helped him get elected. One was he promised to restore law and order, uh, which was obviously that wasn't going on in uh, 1968. Uh, so that was one thing he did do, I think they say afterwards a little bit, or he's tried to. I think it's something that uh, Donald Trump ran on in 2016, and it's part of why he got elected, uh, I think, because of all the riots and other things that was kind of going on at the time in 2016, if you remember that. Uh, also, he, he planned to try to end the Vietnam War. I'll get to it later, but he had this idea called Vietnamization, uh, where he would turn the war over to the South Vietnamese to fight the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, and we would just withdraw uh, from Vietnam. So that, that idea was kind of popular, of course, uh, as well. Uh, then they had another other candidates that were also running uh, as well. I wanted to mention uh, they had also Robert F. Kennedy, uh, who was of course the brother of John F. Kennedy, who had been the Attorney General under JFK originally. He had, I think, at one point been a senator 
uh, as well. Uh, and um, uh, if you know about him, he was actually pretty successful. Kennedy was actually at one point probably one of the big anti-war candidates uh, that was running uh, in 1968. But what happened, if you know about it, he was shot and killed uh, on June 5th, 1968, right after he won the California primary. Uh, and uh, he was at this hotel called the Ambassador Hotel. I think they tore it down, I think, years ago. And they were walking through the kitchen. This man shot him, uh, who, of course, was uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Well, I think I've got a picture of right here. Here's a famous picture after he got shot, by the way. There's some bus boy that was kind of trying to help him, I guess, after he got shot. But Sirhan Sirhan, who was, I think, only 22 years old, shot RFK. Uh, I think one in the back of the head and one in the neck. Uh, I think he died right afterwards, uh, I think a couple days right after. And uh, Sir Ann Sir Ann was this Palestinian Christian that was mad because the fact that Robert F. Kennedy uh, wanted to give uh, support to Israel. Uh, and uh, so they think that's one theory of why he shot him. They do think he shot him, but there's been been some conspiracy theories, I think, over the years uh, that speculated that there may have been more than one gunman uh, because uh, four or five other people were actually hit uh, when he fired like three shots uh, at Kennedy. So some people think there may have been two gunmen, of course, instead of one gun. So quite, quite possible uh, with that. But he's still in prison. I, I think he still ain't dead. Uh, this guy, Sirhan Sirhan, that's the older guy on the left that you're looking at. Uh, also, they had H Hubert Humphrey. He also ran as well, who had been the vice president, of course, of Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, he, he was from Minnesota, of course, a Democrat. Uh, so he's the one, by the way, uh, that would be nominated at the Democratic National Convention, which I told you was marred by violence. Or he had all these different groups that showed up, Vietnam veterans, hippies, Black Panthers, uh, the Weather Underground. I don't know you heard of them, the Weathermen. The Weathermen, as Bob Dylan called them. Uh, they were these uh, mostly college students uh, that basically bombed buildings like college campuses and actually bombed the Capitol building at one point, believe it or not. SDS, may have heard of SDS also as well. They were probably there uh, as well. And they burned down part of Chicago as they were nominating, of course, Hubert Humphrey uh, as well. Uh, then they had this other guy. They had one more guy running too uh, in 98, George Wallace. Uh, who was a governor of Alabama, he ran in 1972, too. He got shot later, too, I think, as well. 1972, I think it was. But uh, Wallace uh, was this staunch segregationist from Alabama uh, who did not want to segregate the schools. Uh, if you know about this, he was famous uh, for, I think, in 1963, standing in the uh, in a schoolhouse door uh, at the University of Alabama. He was very, very famous about that. Uh, so he didn't want to segregate things. And, you know, in the 1960s, they had all these desegregation of like universities, like Ole Miss University. Uh, they tried to desegregate it in 1962. Uh, James Meredith, you heard of him, he was the first college student at um, Ole Miss uh, as well. So they had all those kind of things going on uh, at the same time. And he ran on, on a separate party uh, that was called the American Independent Party. Uh, it was called. And it helped to siphon votes away uh, from Hubert Humphrey. Uh, and so what ended up happening uh, was basically, if you go back to that map here, uh, you could see uh, that the Democrats failed to get southern states there. Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, all, of course, eventually went to Wallace uh, instead of Humphrey. That could have helped him win the election, maybe, or something like that. Uh, but uh, you can see how... Like I said, the South, South is starting to fade uh, pretty much with that election. Uh, and by the way, Nixon had this thing I told you may call the Southern Strategy, where he tried to, to, you know, to basically court a lot of white Southerners to join the Republican Party. And so that's something you start seeing really, of course, uh, in, in basically the not late 60s, early 70s. All right, let me move on to talk about, of course, um, what we're talking about with Nixon. So Nixon comes in. Uh, president Nixon. He's president, by the way, from 1969 uh, to 1974. 
Uh, as you know, Nixon is famous for Watergate. I probably won't be able to get to that today, uh, but I think I'll probably get to it. I know at the beginning uh, or my last lecture on, on what is Thursday, but Nixon's famous for Watergate. Uh, he's the only president to resign uh, from the office of the White House. He, he would have been impeached if he wanted to step down, uh, as you know. And uh, as I told you before, um, Nixon ran on basically uh, Vietnamization, this idea where the United States would supply like military equipment, training, you know, various military advisors uh, that would help South Vietnam fight communists and all that. And so it was a way that helped to get him elected. And I think all the strife associated with all the rioting and all this other stuff going on in the 60s helped to get Nixon also elected because I told you he ran on this idea of law and order. Uh, over time, it would fail. If you know about this, Vietnamization didn't work. <laughs> uh, we withdrew our forces by 1973, uh, but within like two years, uh, of course, what happened uh, with North Vietnam eventually overran South Vietnam uh, when Gerald Ford was president, and so Vietnam fell later. So it didn't it didn't work in the end. Uh, but it was an idea, I guess, to try to get us out of the war uh, because it was so unpopular and all the protesting that was, you know, going on uh, at the time. Now, let me talk about some things that were kind of famous under Nixon's first term before we get to the second one, where they had the Watergate thing. Uh, they had the Vietnam War protest. They kept going. And you, you think they probably ended, right? No, they didn't. They kept going, I think, under pretty much Nixon's administration. Uh, there was like a bunch of things that really helped to kind of make people mad, of course, that led to more protests, of course, uh, in the Vietnam War. And uh, there was one, of course, I'll put here, uh, which was very famous, uh, was the Melee Massacre uh, that they had uh, that happened in 1968, which, by the way, did not happen under Nixon, happened under at the end of LBJ's administration uh, that occurred. And uh, the Melee Massacre was this uh, incident where American soldiers massacred like a Vietnamese village that was called Melee. Uh, I think it was in South Vietnam. And uh, they thought these people were somehow helping out the Viet Cong. And so a bunch of them mowed them down, uh, American soldiers. They killed like 500 men, women, and children. Just killed them in cold blood. That's a picture actually of them. Some of them got killed right there. And uh, there was a massive cover-up of it. Uh, in, in the actual government and in the military. But eventually they, people found out about it. And so about 26 soldiers that eventually were arrested at one point for it that were charged with, with actually the massacre. Only one guy actually got convicted of it, which was Lieutenant William Calais. Uh, he was actually convicted, uh, but uh, he was later pardoned by Richard Nixon, I think within like a year or so after. Uh, so, uh, there was actually this guy named Hugh Thompson, who was from Louisiana, who actually and it was in a helicopter. He actually uh, got his helicopter between them and the people being massacred, and he was able to stop it. Uh, so not as many people got massacred because uh, this guy from Louisiana, I think he died in Pineville, I think in northern Louisiana. Uh, so it's an interesting guy about that from Louisiana. So they had that, that created a lot of protests because, you know, people start saying, hey, we're a bunch of baby killers. Uh, over there killing people. You will start to think that, that kind of thing. Uh, also, they led to mass protests they had because uh, another thing that happened too uh, in the Vietnam War uh, was um, they had this deal uh, where uh, they found out in 1970 that the United States was invading and bombing Cambodia. The reason why we did this was because of the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, where the North Vietnamese was infiltrating into the South, you know, through Laos, Cambodia. And so that's why we started bombing it. We started invading into there with troops. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie called Apocalypse Now. That's kind of why they're in there, I guess, uh, because of that. Uh, so probably back in the 60s, they were already doing this already uh, at this point. They don't find out about it until 1970. And so because of mass protests against the war, a lot of universities have National Guardsmen uh, that are there on campus. Uh, and so it leads to a lot of shootings between students, of course, and National Guardsmen 
Uh, there are two shootings that were very famous. Uh, they had one which happened at Kent State University uh, in Kentucky, uh, which um, actually in Ohio, yeah, Kent State University in Ohio is where it is actually, not, not Kentucky. Uh, and um, four students were actually shot dead by National Guardsmen. Another nine were actually wounded. And uh, they actually made a song about it later. You may have heard of it. It's kind of like a war protest song, uh, which was done by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, which is called Ohio. You may have heard of that song, which is about it. Uh, and uh, so they had that incident that happened in 1970. Uh, also, in uh, I think the same year, 1970, Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, there were a bunch of African-American students that were shot dead or wounded uh, as well. Uh, for protesting against the war. So there's all kinds of people protesting against the war, black, white, whatever, um, that were there. And uh, the shootings were so bad that it caused actually a national strike in 1970. In fact, students on college and high, high school campuses actually went on strike. Uh, they walked out of their classrooms and all that, uh, but they were mostly peaceful protests uh, that were going on. Uh, then they had this other thing that happened, too, uh, which was very famous that kind of made Nixon pretty mad, uh, if you know about it. That was the so-called uh, Pentagon Papers uh, were released uh, to the New York Times, uh, which they think Daniel Ellsberg uh, was behind this. Uh, who uh, who was Ellsberg? I'll kind of get into that in a second about who he was. But Ellsberg uh, released the Pentagon Papers, which was this kind of a study uh, in a history of the Vietnam War, and what it basically did uh, was it it actually uncovered like all the secret operations uh, that were kind of going on uh, in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, that the military, CIA uh, was kind of involved in. Uh, Ellsberg, by the way, uh, was a military analyst for the RAND Corporation, which the RAND Corporation, if you know about it, is a think tank for the U.S. military. Uh, and so he uncovered this, uh, and um, they found out that all this secret stuff, the secret war in Vietnam, you know, was kind of going on. And they even discovered this thing called, you ever heard of um, Air America? It was very famous. You've probably heard of uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, there was a CIA airline that they developed, uh, which was involved in a lot of covert operations, uh, and uh, they also, I think, were involved in drug smuggling because some people think that the Vietnam War was about drugs because uh, the fact that all the heroin was coming from the so-called Golden Triangle, which is like an area like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, all those being like all the poppy plants were pretty much growing right there at the time. I think now they're in Afghanistan where all the heroin's coming from. Maybe that's why the Afghanistan war is going on. That's where all the heroin is. It's interesting about that. You know, think about it. But um Evidently, uh, the Pentagon Papers made Richard Nixon really mad, uh, if you know about this. So he started this unit called the White House Plumbers uh, to try to prevent classified leaks uh, that were in the federal government uh, and all that. And I'll get to it later, but uh, it's going to cause the Watergate scandal to occur. It's going to occur uh, during Nixon's second term. Actually happened in 1972, Watergate, because that's when a lot of the plumbers got arrested uh, for breaking into the Watergate Hotel, uh, which was where the Democratic National Headquarters was when they were running against uh, Nixon in 72. Uh, and um, anyway, it's going to later lead to Nixon resigning. Uh, and what's going to happen, of course, uh, is that Gerald Ford will be president later. He'll be the 38th president uh, that will follow Nixon. Uh, after he resigns. Uh, and that was just because of the fact that Spiru Agnew, uh, who was the vice president under Nixon, actually resigned uh, because of income tax evasion. <laughs> so there was all kinds of issues that Nixon had uh, under his administration uh, as well. Uh, Ford wasn't any better. Ford, I guess I'll talk about Ford for now. Uh, but Ford, Ford uh, was controversial uh, because he pardoned Nixon <laughs> right after. He pardoned Nixon, you know, for Watergate uh, and all that. But he did help end the Vietnam War. But the 1970s was, I'll get to it later, was not a great period. Uh, it was a period of like 
we're going to probably talk about really, we'll get to like Ford Carter. We'll talk about the Reagan administration. I might even get to the 1990s uh, as well. Uh, but the United States is going to go through a period of what they call stagflation, which really starts probably in the late 60s uh, because of the Vietnam conflict. You know, they're spending all this money on the war, uh, putting a man on the moon. Uh, they're spending money uh, on all these entitlements, uh, et cetera. And then you got the oil crisis that happens too in the 1970s. So all of this is going to help to eventually, of course, lead to a lot of bad economic times, of course, that will follow, of course, later. So I'll talk about later. We'll get more, I think, not today. I don't think I have time to really go into Watergate. Uh, but next, next, my last lecture, I'll talk about the 1970s uh, to the present. I'll talk about Nixon, the end of Nixon's era. We'll talk about Ford, Carter, Reagan, uh, and then I'll get up to like maybe a little bit. I'll probably talk a little bit for a few minutes, I guess, about the post-Cold War era also a little bit as well. So that's going to be it for today, uh, lecture-wise. Um, just a reminder before I go, uh, but don't forget, we have the finals coming up, of course, this week and next week. I will, I will have the final exam probably posted starting sometime Thursday uh, that I'll have. It's mostly going to be, of course, mostly on World War II and probably the Cold War era will be the main topics, of course, for, for the final. So uh, if you did not turn your research paper in, uh, make sure you get that to me, uh, like email it to me. I think it might be closed, uh, probably in Canvas for you to maybe upload it, but um, you need to do that. And then I did tell you that the uh, Veterans Oral History Project is, of course, an assignment that you need to wrap up if you're doing it, which will be due, I think, on Saturday, May 1st, I think is the deadline. So that's it for today. I'll see you later, of course, in the week. I should already have a new assignment, of course, posted right now as well. So yeah, take care, Ross. Hope you all have a great day, uh, pretty much. So see you later.